Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise in support of this bill. Mr. Speaker, I would like to preface my contribution to this bill with a few comments to help me put this issue and the debate into context. Firstly, people of goodwill with the same set of facts can arrive at different conclusions because they're different lived experience. While this is true, it is important that we acknowledge what this debate is and is not about. This is also true for our First Nations people. The fact there is some difference of opinion within the Aboriginal community on this issue of the voice is not of any surprise. Part of this discussion and debate, we, we have to address that our understanding of Australian history has been to date a European version, and that has impacted on our laws and culture. The High Court decision in Mabo went a little way to correct this historical record, but not far enough. We now understand there's another valid version of Australia's history from the perspective of the First Nations people. This is also true of Christian theology and the impact this has had on Aboriginal people. We need to understand and accept that there is an Aboriginal interpretation of the Christian faith if we honestly believe that we are born in his image. The time has come for an acceptance of the Aboriginal Christian theology if we are to truly become a reconciled nation, but that is a discussion for another day. The voice process has been informed by the Uluru Statement from the heart, so I believe it is important to insert into this debate key elements of the statement as it provides context as to why this bill is important, not only to Aboriginal people, but to the nation as a whole. Like the Prime Minister has commented, the Uluru Statement is like our Gettysburg Address. It is like Lincoln's speech, a simple statement that has profound meaning. It acknowledges, it acknowledges a harsh but truthful reality. It is also a statement of great hope for our nation as it speaks for a better future which we know is within our reach. But we need an open and uncluttered mind and a heart full of compassion if we are going to make it happen. The statement is like a love letter to the nation from the heart of the Aboriginal people and from the geographic and political heart of their country and our nation. This is how First Nations people share, see our shared history, and I quote from the statement. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands, and possessed it under their own, own laws and customs. This is how our ancestors did, according to the reckoning of our culture, from the creation, according to the common law, from time immemorial, and according to science, more than 60,000 years ago. Mr. Speaker, since colonisation or settlement, we have either done it to the Aboriginal people through the dispossession of their lands, language and culture. We have killed on their lands, taken their children, and at times enslaved them. Or we have done it for them. We've placed them on intermissions. We've diminished their language and culture that, is, that it was not permitted to evolve over time. Or we gave them sit-down money or welfare, which impoverished a generation of Aboriginal people. And what are the consequences of these policies? Let me quote from the statement. Proportionally, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We're not innately criminal people. Our children are alienated from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them and our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of, a, of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of the problem. This is the torment of our pow powerlessness. Now is the time for us to walk with First Nation peoples. But we need to start the story at the beginning and the statement provides a First Nations perspective and I quote, in 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave our base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. First Nations people invite the Australian people to walk with them. Where do we go from here? And I quote, we seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over the, our destiny, our children will flourish. They will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to their country. 
We, will call, we call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is a culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. These are the three elements of the Uluru Statement, voice, treaty and truth-telling. And this bill is about creating a voice to Parliament. This will build a foundation and create the architecture for a treaty and truth-telling process. The voice underpins the First Nations ability to engage in a treaty and truth-telling process. Mr Speaker, what are we as a Labor Party or Labor government done to date? And I'd like to quote some, some, some events of Labor's record on Aboriginal affairs. In 1966, Mr Speaker, the then Labor, State Labor Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Don Dunstan, introduced the first Aboriginal land rights legislation in Australia to establish the Aboriginal Lands Trust. In 1975, Labor Prime Minister Gough Whitlam famously poured a handful of red soil into the hand of Vincent Ngari. This symbolised the legal transfer of Wave Hill Station back to Jirindi people. It also meant that Jirindi people became the first Aboriginal community to have land returned to them by the Commonwealth Government. In 1981, South Australia passes the right land rights legislation for the APY lands, built on the work of Labor under Dun Dunstan. In 1992, Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating delivers the Red Fern speech. He outlined the injustices committed against Aboriginal people since colonisation and asked us all to imagine if it was us. In 1995, Federal Labor Attorney General Michael Lavarque instigated the Bringing Them Home report. The report was delivered under Liberals, but some findings were rejected and John Howard refused to say sorry. In 2008, Labor Prime Minister Kevin Rudd made a formal apology to the stolen generations whose lives had been blighted by past government policies of forced child removal and assimilation. In 2015, South Australia became the first mainland, mainland state to introduce a stolen generations reparation scheme under Labor Aboriginal Affairs Minister Kaya Ma. In 2019, South Australian Labor leader Peter Malinowskis commits the Labor Party and the Labor government to, state -based implementation, to a state-based implementation of the Rouge Statement from the heart. And this, and this brings us to what we are debating here today, Mr Speaker. This bill creates the structures and processes to give First Nations people a voice to parliament and state government. It is, it is importantly, based on a full First Nations franchise. They elect their representatives. The proposal has been criticised for a number of reasons, Mr Speaker, including it won't make a tangible difference, in other words, it won't improve Aboriginal disadvantage, it is race-based and therefore we should be rejected, a treaty should come first, an issue of sovereignty. Coming to the first criticism, Mr Speaker, about Aboriginal disadvantage, and I concur with the Minister's just comments a few moments, moments ago that the, the, this, the voice itself will not address these issues directly. But importantly, the voice will help form, inform policies and avoid the policy failures of the past. Yes, there exists a huge challenge to address the disproportionate disadvantage that, that overall First Nations people experience. But the voice will enable, enable parliaments and government to develop the right policies to make a real difference. It is race-based. Mr Speaker, race is a social construct. Its, it's, it's, its term came about as a way of justifying Western colonisation from the 15th century onwards. In other words, justify the conquest of other First Nation countries. There has no basis in science. As the Deputy Premier, a member of Port Adelaide, Port Adelaide said in her contribution to this debate, we need to accept the profound difference between the idea of race and that of culture. Race does not exist. It is an artificial distinction between people that has no foundation in fact. We are all human. There may be a wide variety of how we look, but there's no discernible difference of any significance between people of any nation 
on this earth. Any suggestion that this legislation is about this outdated notion of race is simply wrong. What is important is the idea of culture. That the treaty should come first is one of the criticisms. Mr Speaker, the voice will determine who will speak on behalf of the First Nations people in a treaty process, and that's why it precedes the negotiation of a treaty. The issue of sovereignty. The statement itself, I think, Mr Speaker, addresses this issue very well, and I quote, this sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to, the thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of our ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty. It has never been exceeded or extinguished and importantly, Mr Speaker, and I, and I say this bit, it coexists with the sovereignty, sovereignty, sovereignty of the Crown. What is the alternative model? To have a, to have a voice which is partially appointed, one de which denies the First Nations people self-determination. This would, in my opinion, Mr Speaker, be a step back to colonial Australia. In speaking in opposition to this bill, the member for Heysen said, in part as follows. Let's approach the matter with, with the humility and the diligence that the subject matter requires because there should be not any hint of grandiosity in what we are debating here. It is true to say, and I do not think that there is anything controversial in an observation, that the difficulties, the challenges, the opportunities that Aboriginal people in this state have experienced over the course of South Australian history since 1836 have remained challenging and complex problems for public policy, for parliaments, for governments, and for those who would work alongside Aboriginal people. Mr Speaker, while I agree wholeheartedly with the member's sentiments, I do not agree with the conclusion he reaches. As the Premier said in his contribution to the bill, we must have the humility enough to say that what we have been doing has not been working well enough. If things are to improve, things also need to change. This legislation has involved extensive consultation with communities all over South Australia, aimed at ensuring that the voice will be robust, informed and inclusive. Mr Speaker, we continue that journey this week.